Welcome everybody to North Point Plus. Woohoo! It's episode 152. I'm Jamie. If you Our newest know. hostess. <laughs> yeah. Host. I've been on one other time. <laughs> now, but not as the host. Here I am hosting. <laughs> yeah. And we actually have a studio audience today. Yes, we do. We have a couple people sitting in here watching <laughs> us. But we welcome our studio audience. Yes. <laughs> but they're not cheering audience. or anything. That's right. We have a live audience. <laughs> so. How are you? we are. I'm good. How what br- what what brings you to the table today? Sylvia emailed me. Good for, <laughs> good for her. Good I for said, her. Sure, why not? Ah, I'm, how's it feel to be over there? It's different. This is like not in my element right now. This is not your comfort zone? I have a microphone, zone? but it's a little different. Are you nervous? <laughs> Uh, maybe a little. Knowing that but millions and millions, millions of, of people, of people are, are hanging on your yeah. words. Yes. And they will live forever. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is uh, actually not really. No. It's just conversation. Okay. Right? Yep. We'll get through it. Good. <laughs> Worship was great. Thanks. Yesterday. Thanks. Fun new song. Yes, that was a fun new song. Lots of words, but yep. good words. And great song at the end. Mm-hmm. Very fitting with the message. It fit perfectly. Yeah. So, as soon as we started singing, I was like, man, this really does fit it's, it's really well. It's a great fit. Great <laughs> fit. Take you at your word. Yeah. yeah. So, all right. Well, we have a few questions from yesterday. Do you want me to talk about the message first? Great message. Oh, thanks. Sure. You can talk about it if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about it in life group because we okay. are one of those weird groups that still meets all summer. Good for you. So, we talked about it. We actually can talk uh, um, in a... In just a second, maybe we can talk a little bit about life groups, Mm -hmm. Um, because I think that there was a part of the message that I really wanted to talk more about how important life group stuff is. Yeah. Um, So, um, so what did you talk about in life group? We went through like your three points at the end, you know, and really kind of broke that down. And good, we'll go there in a second. How's that? Mm -hmm. You, uh, how about if I be the host and you can answer? Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Um, So we started this new series called Move the Line. Yeah. Um, yes, move the line. I keep going back and forth because we called it move the line, but then I think Johnny Cash walked the line, right. uh, and then we added the whose line, line is, is, it, anyway. is it anyway, which is, I think, a great, I think we'll come back to that over the next four or five weeks um, multiple times because it really is all about God's line. So the, the whole concept is that God communicates to us and that there's great danger for us when we move the line that God has given us, when, when we either make the line, uh, we move it to a place that's different for our protection, but we put our trust in that protection that comes because we've moved the line, or when we move the line to justify our behavior because we're not really living out what God has called us to do. Right. And so we kind of rationalize and say, well, Oh, yeah. You can twist any scripture around to fit your need. Yeah, or or your behavior. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which is uh, um, so as as we as I work through the message, that actually was, um, I think one of the one of the things I put down there. I'll just talk about it now. The I had originally entitled the the talk the legalistic line mm-hmm. because I was I was thinking in my mind when we talk about moving the line that oftentimes we move the line to a place that God didn't set it and we demand that everybody live on that line and it it really does become legalism so that we we demand that people agree with us and that we that they do the things that we um, are convicted about doing and we create this legalistic kind of framework that um, people have to live according to the standard that's not the standard that God gave. Mm -hmm. And Jesus came to blow that up, basically. That's where I thought I was going to go originally when I Mm -hmm. titled the message that way. And that's really kind of half of where I went. But as I really got working on it, it really became apparent to me that there are lots of times that we move the line kind of in the opposite direction um, to, to, to rationalize our behavior and to do what we want rather than what God has said. And, um, and I tried to physically demonstrate that with the movement of the balance beam. And um, I, I hope that that made sense. I, I think the, the visual of that just continually yeah. moving, um, it just helped reinforce, man, we've, we've got to stick close to God's word. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, I thought it was a great message. Good. Thanks. So did our life group. Good. <laughs> Good. So, 
All right. Well, we do have a few questions. Okay. Let's throw them at me. All right. We have a couple from Diane. Good. So, and she said, could all the animals speak or was it just the serpent? That's a really fun question. In the Garden of Eden, could all of the animals speak or just the serpent? We don't know. If you read C.S. Lewis, Chronicles of Narnia, Mm -hmm. all of the animals could speak. (laughs) Um, the, um, but they lost that ability, whatever. I, we really don't know. And so that's one of those things. You don't want to move the line and say, oh, no, they couldn't, or yes, mm-hmm. they could. We, d- we just don't know because Scripture's um, quiet about that. Ultimately, um, you know, with Balaam in the Old Testament, a donkey speaks. Um, uh, God speaks through a, a donkey. Yeah. An angel speaks through a donkey. Um, so we don't, we don't know, but clearly we have, uh, we have this record of the serpent speaking um, to Eve, and it makes you wonder, you know, did did the serpent sound like James Earl Jones, <laughs> or did <Right>. the, <laughs> Eve, Darth <laughs> or Darth Vader, <laughs> <laughs> or it's, uh-huh. or like um, what's what's the name of the snake on the Jungle, the jungle Book? Jungle Book. Um, I can't remember what his name uh, was, but I know what you're talking. Oh uh, yeah, somebody put it in the comments. That'll yeah. help us. Um, Bagheera. Uh, was Baloo. Mm-hmm. Uh, all I can remember is that snake singing, trust in me, yeah. just in me. <laughs> Close your eyes. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, okay. uh, we, we, so we don't know. But the, but the serpent talked to Eve, uh, brought stuff up, and, and made, I think, Eve doubt what God had, had uh, the instruction that God had given, mm-hmm. and um, led her astray. And right. All the mess that we have now is tied back to that. Right. So kind of along those same lines, did the serpent use Eve to talk to because she didn't directly hear from God? Uh, that, you know, that's a really uh, good question. Uh, we, were, we were just talking before we started the podcast, and um, when you read through the text, you don't know, but it sure looks like God gives that instruction to Adam before Eve has been created, where he says you can eat of uh, everything. You, you've you got to tend the garden. You can eat wherever you want, just not that tree. Um, and so, if that's the case, Eve would have gotten the instruction indirectly from God through Adam. And and I think part of the lesson that's there is that any time that we get indirect. Um, indirect direction from God. So like if, if I say, oh man, I'm really convicted about this particular thing, I shouldn't do this, and I tell you that, mm-hmm. and you say, oh yeah, that makes good sense, um, and, and you say, I'm not going to do that either, it becomes much easier if you're living off of my conviction for you to, be, uh, to lose track of that mm-hmm. be- because you've not wrestled with that particular issue, that particular right. command, that particular direction from God, guideline, whatever it is, um, it becomes much easier to rationalize it away or to say, eh, that's not really what I want to do. Yeah. When I think when God speaks to us directly, um, it becomes much more difficult for us, oh, we can obviously still rationalize it away, but if we've wrestled with that, our conviction is much stronger. And and that goes back to one of the main points out of the message was that we've got to know God's Word. We've got to um, right. let God's Word be inside us, in our head, in our hearts all the mm-hmm. time um, to, to help shape the way that we think and the, the way that we act. Right. Okay. There's a good question. This is an Still important from Diane. one. Diane, yes. Yeah, Diane Were, Adams, we thank yes. you for this question. Were there outhouses in the Garden of Eden? Um, you know, <laughs> I don't think so. The Maybe the better question is, was there toilet paper right. in the Garden <laughs> of Eden? Who knows? Um, uh, we didn't have any in Kenya. In the, <laughs> <laughs> on the That's safari. true. That's true. <laughs> Um, but probably not. Probably that would be my guess. Would everything be, no. worked. All systems worked just yeah. the way that God had designed, yeah. and um, that they, they, you know, they were naked and not ashamed, and so they could take care of business without having yep. to worry about taking care of business. Right. All right. Any questions? 
any questions are allowed yes. <laughs> on the podcast. Keeps it fun. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, next question. Not sure who this is from, but why did God put the tree there if they weren't supposed to eat from it? You know, I think probably since uh, probably since Adam and Eve, people have been asking that question. Why, why did God do that? Um, he certainly didn't do it to set them up like um, you know, cheese on a mousetrap right. um, so that they could get thwacked if they stepped out of line. I don't think it was that at all. I do think that there's that there really is this um, concept in knowing that um, in order for us to relate to God in a way that that our love is real, we have to have free will. We have to have the ability to choose to do what He wants rather than to be forced to do what He wants. So if, if God had put them in the garden and there was nothing to tempt them, if there was, if there was no guideline for them, they would have really just been robots. They would have just been God's playthings and with, um, with no with no ability to respond with their whole heart to him um, and to honor him. And by, by putting the, the tree there with uh, knowledge of good and evil, that gave Adam and Eve the ability to say, yeah, that's there, but no, I don't want to go there. That's not what I want to do. That's not how I want to live. I don't, I, I trust God. I trust God at his word. And that, that I think for God as creator, I think just like for us as parents, I you know we can force our kids to do a lot mm-hmm. of things. Um, it's not nearly as um, fulfilling when you force them to do good things, right? As when they choose to do the right yeah. thing. It's just like you know when they choose to treat their brother or sister kindly, right? That does your heart good. Yep. If you ground them until they treat their right. brother or <laughs> sister kindly. Um, you get the behavior, but it's yeah. not the same thing. So I, I think that God placed the tree there so that Adam and Eve could choose to not Obedience. go there. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. That's kind of how I've always thought of it, but that was a little more. You added even more to that. So that's cool. Um, how do we communicate the line when we live in a world that doesn't believe in lines? Um, you know, that, uh, that's, that is, uh, that's where we all live Mm -hmm. because in our society, in Western society in in particular, um, we have made tolerance the greatest virtue. So basically like in our culture, we would say, oh, if you have the line, that's great. Good for you. Mm -hmm. That's not my line. Right. Um, and and so how do we live in that? I, th- I actually think that it goes back to, um, to the personal choices that we make, that, that there really is this sense in which as we know God, as we understand who He is, as we read from Scripture, and we are convicted by the Holy Spirit about what to do, what not to do, how to live, how to, how to live on God's line— um, when we do that and choose that, we can't force that on anybody else. That then becomes legalism. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, it, it, you, you can't do that. But we live on that and just know that there are going to be consequences for that. There are going to be people that don't like it. There are going right. to be people that ostracize you for it. There are going to be people that make fun of you. Um, that, that is what it is. If you're living on God's line, though, you're living to please Him, not to please anybody right. else. And and so you have to live with a perspective to say, yeah, there's going to be temporary blowback, but it's not blowback that matters. It's you know, right. it's it's not, and I'm not going to let that shape my life. I'm mm-hmm. not going to shape let that shape the way that I live. And so um, I think I think it really is a difficult. Um, position, uh, you know, we're in this season that we keep kind of hinting about the election that's coming up. And um, and don't forget next Tuesday to vote in your primary election. Um, but I think it's difficult for politicians or for people who are in positions of influence, or uh, you know, whether that's at work or in politics or whatever, um, in government, to figure out, okay, how do I, how do I help establish lines that honor God 
um, but that that work in the in the context of our culture and our mm-hmm. society, um, and do that in a way that makes sense. And, and I think, well, with, you know, this is like a way big rabbit trail. I think politicians, you look at what Scripture says, and and that they're there, the government's there to to um, reward those who do good, punish those who do evil, and that the politician's job is always to say what's best for the people, you know, what's what's best for our society, and that God's best is always going to come through that, which is different than a religious theocracy, uh, right. you know, uh, than, um, than demanding that that happen in that way. But I, I do think you, you figure out how, how do we create a framework where people can um, live and worship God, where people are valued and honored, they're protected um, in a way that makes sense. Okay. You're too easy. I you're know, you're supposed to I you're know. supposed to push back. <laughs> I trust you. <laughs> well, that's okay. You Maybe. know I push back. <laughs> that, that, that's right. <laughs> um, if proverbs are wise words and not promises, and we take them as promises, are we moving the line? That's a really, really good question. Yeah. That it's kind of a throwback. I, I wonder if I know who wrote this question, even though they didn't put their name <laughs> yeah, on it. No name. Um, we did a series from Proverbs. It's probably been a couple, three years ago. And mm-hmm. one of the things that we talked about in that series consistently was that Proverbs are observational truth, not promises. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so the question is, if we make the if we try and make those to be promises, mm-hmm. is that moving the line? And I think the answer to that is yes. Yeah. I think when whenever we read into scripture something that we want to read into scripture or something that the scripture doesn't say, um, that's moving the line. Yeah. I I you know in in prepping the message, it was really interesting, and I hope it made sense in the in the context of the message. When I read the end of John, um, where Jesus and Peter interact, mm-hmm. um, it was such a great demonstration of the principle that I was trying to communicate. Um, but I wanted it to fit in the context of everything, and so I wanted to tell us. I just wanted to reinforce again that that clearly, once sin came in the world, Jesus ultimately came to forgive our sin, to fix everything. But that after the resurrection, as they have that encounter, and Jesus says to, uh, you know, Peter says to Jesus, what about John? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to get old and people are going to take care of me and I'm going to die this way. What about John? And Jesus says, you know what, if I want John to do this or that or whatever, what's that to you? And that that the reaction of the disciples was, oh, John's going to live until Jesus comes back. And that wasn't what Jesus right. said. So I think anytime that we go to Scripture and we and we take out of context something that is moving the line, and that's it's just really dangerous because all of a sudden our trust gets connected to the way that we have moved the line rather than to what God originally said, and and that's a really dangerous thing because then all of a sudden you. Uh, when, when God doesn't act in the way that you've established that God has to act because you've moved the line, then you're disappointed and disillusioned, and it's like, this doesn't make any sense at all. Right. Um, and so uh, it's, it, I think that that's a, a really good recognition. Um, you know, um, yeah, I, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, the answer to that is yes. yes. <laughs> okay, so we've got a couple more here. You want? Yeah, uh, you know what? Let, let, before we go to the to the other stuff, talk about the the main points. You talk about the main points from the message that you guys talked about in life. Okay, what was the first one? I can't think of what. It well, was. that's why I wanted you to talk about. I know. It. Um, Remind the, me what it was. Well, I uh, the f- the first thing really was um, when I got down to the end. I'm looking at the yeah. the the wrong end of my stuff. Um, Walking, uh, where, was it walking God's line consistently needs three things? Yes. Knowing where the line is and not moving it. Yeah, I think that was that was one that we talked about, like, what is the line? Like, is it the Ten Commandments? <laughs> like, Oh, good. You know, yeah. or, you know, did Jesus change all that when he came? You know, like, what what is the line? And that we should be we should be talking to God and praying for him to show us that line. Like, what is the line? And not, you know, not to go off of it. 
and how to not go off of it, you know? Yeah, so so is that where you guys landed? Pretty much. Yeah. Like, we were, you know, we don't really fully understand, you know, cause, because, like we've said, Scripture, you can twist it anyway to fit your needs or, you know, your behavior right. or whatever. So, you know, that's your interpretation of it or whatever. So, like, where is the line and how do we know exactly what that line is? Yeah, I, th- I think... I, I really do think that it comes down to um, consistent consistency in study mm-hmm. um, and in recognizing, okay, in the Old Testament, there were 612 laws. Mm-hmm. So walking that line, right. not just pretty <laughs> tough, but impossible. Yeah. You know, Paul said you can't do it. Right. You, you, know, you can't keep the, whole, the, the law that way. And then you come back to Jesus and, and, and they say, what's the most important one? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And then the second one's like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Right. And so if that becomes the line, right. yeah, okay, what's it look like for me to love God with everything that I am? Mm-hmm. And what's it look like for me to love people? Then all of a sudden, I think the line, do, it really does become clearer because it's like, okay, how do I live that out? How do I live it out mm-hmm. at work? How do I live it out? Um at home, how do I live it out with mm-hmm. my kids, with my spouse, uh, all those things. That's um, that recognizing that line, mm-hmm. uh, man, there's plenty to do to yes. be consumed with just those two things. Yes, for sure. Yeah. And I feel like for myself, like if I'm following the line, I'm going to know. Like, I'm yeah. going to, and if I'm not, I'm going to feel that from the Holy Spirit and, yeah. you know, God and whatever that I'm drifting yeah. from the line or moving the line, you know, like, you know, that's not right. Yes. <laughs> you know, so, so that's how I feel about it. And yeah. There's uh, um, just as you were talking, this image came up to me um, a whole bunch of years ago, Dem and I used to teach a parenting class. Mm-hmm. And in the parenting class, one of the things that we talked about was that when your kids are little, like when they're um, really young, preschool, you know, mm-hmm. infants, that kind of stuff, as parents, you are the moral conscience of your child. Like they're not born with a moral conscience. Right. You have to teach them. You have to be their moral conscience to help them know right from wrong. Mm-hmm. Because everyone, it doesn't matter who you are as an adult, you have a moral conscience. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you live in the mafia world, they're still right and wrong. Right. There's a code there. Yeah. So with your kids, you're the moral conscience of them. And that your job as they're growing up is to give them enough pieces, enough principles mm-hmm. in what we called their moral warehouse so that when they encountered a new situation, they could walk up and down the rows of the moral warehouse and say, okay, how does this particular thing fit with the things that I know that mm-hmm. I've been taught? And so you have to teach principles, not just rules. Because mm-hmm. if you just teach rules, your kid goes away to college and all of a sudden all the rules that they had at home it's are different. thrown out the window because yeah. there's, no, no there's no accountability <laughs> right. and they can do whatever they want. Mm-hmm. But if you've taught the principles, the the if if you've put the stuff on the shelf in the moral warehouse, that in any environment, you know, when they're when they're ten, when they're twelve, when they're fifteen, when they're eighteen, whatever it is, they have the ability to say, okay, what what's at stake here? What's mm-hmm. what is right or wrong? What is the choice that I want to make? And I think that 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 same thing comes true as it as it relates to this when we're talking about the line of God. That when we know God, when we know his word, that we come up in any kind of situation and there is this sense of, oh, it's not about a rule. It's right. it's not about whether I eat this or don't eat that. Right. It really is about, okay, where's the heart of God in this? Yeah. And how have I seen that in the past? And how do I live that out yeah. right now in this situation? Right. Kind of a what would Jesus do? Yeah, type yeah, of thing. Ab- absolutely. How would Jesus handle this situation? Yeah. The um, the the second thing that I talked about, you know, knowing knowing God's word, uh, knowing where the line is, that's so important. The second thing was having a spotter. Yes. Um, so, what did you guys talk about with that? We definitely agree with that. I mean, like I said, like we meet throughout the summer. We love being together. We love doing life together. 
Um, we meet as much as possible and we talk through things. We help each other through these questions, through, you know, through life and whatever life throws at us. And so having a spotter, you know, if we can see, hey, you're kind of, that's not right. You know, yeah, we have that relationship that we can say that to one another. Right. You're like, are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> you know, and so having that spotter to be able to see and have a relationship with and help you maybe think through some things. Yeah. That you're going through and you're starting to drift away from that line. I, and I think, well, ultimately, the ultimately, the ultimate spotter is the Holy Spirit. Yeah. The Holy Spirit is the one who really works within us to say, no, 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 don't do that. Um, But I do think that there is, in the context of relationship, Mm -hmm. um, when when you have people in your life who can ask the questions, but who can also say, that's not a good idea, that, you know, that they have, they have the guts and the, and the um, collateral in mm-hmm. in terms of in your relationship to be able to say that's not the path that I'd, I that I think is the right one for right. you and you may they you may, may listen to us and they may and, not. and they may not they may not but but, but you've got that that yeah. person who can be there and the other piece that's there for a spotter so interesting to me to watch the olympics last week and I don't know that I had ever noticed before that on the parallel bars um, or the uneven bars the spotters that are there that they kept, well, I kept thinking, get out of the way. They, you know, you're in, <laughs> right. you're in the way, you're in the way of the shot, yeah. watching the people. But they're there to make sure that if they fall, that they don't get hurt. Right. Um, too bad. Uh, you know, that they can that they can lessen the impact of that fall. And I think that that part of the sometimes we think, oh, if I'm a spot, if I'm a spotter in your life, mm-hmm. my job is to tell you, don't do that, Jamie. Right. Um, and oftentimes I think. The role of the spotter is to cushion the mistake mm-hmm. as, and, and to and to lessen the impact of that as much as possible, and there to be able to help pick somebody up when they yeah. when they do mess up, when they do fall off the bars, <clears throat> um, and and get them back on track. And that's yeah, that's, that's I think why why life group's so important mm-hmm. that even when you've screwed up, even when you've gone completely off the rails, there's some people there who can say, you know what, we still love you. Hang in there. Yep. Get, get back on the bars. Finish finish the routine. Yep. Um, hang in there. That I I just think that's so important. Yeah. yeah. I mean you'll see in the uh bumper video. You have a spotter. I have a spotter. <laughs> and why do you have a spotter on that bumper video? <laughs> well when they said we were gonna do this walking on the balance beam, I was like, are you guys kidding me? I can't even walk down the sidewalk without <laughs> Falling and breaking my leg. <laughs> um, are you being literal about I that? Li- being <laughs> literal. I have literally broken my leg getting something out of my car. So, and then in Kenya, I fell. And got a, hurt. a little crack in a the little s- crack in the sidewalk, and I hurt my leg significantly. Yeah. So when they asked me to get on that balance beam, I was like, "You're nuts." <laughs> <laughs> someone's going to help me cross. And, and you and you <laughs> and did it. Yes, I did it, and I had help, and that is an important yeah. of a spotter. Yeah, like you love it. doesn't matter what you're doing. <laughs> it's good to have a spotter. That's, yeah. So. Yep. Mm-hmm. Third thing um, was practice. Yes, and that's being in God's Word. Yeah, and, and, and keeping at it mm-hmm. even when you mess up. It was really interesting to me to watch... Um, Simone Biles, and to watch her practice stuff mm-hmm. before she actually did the event when she was doing her, her vault and thinking, man, she missed that one bad. Like right. she, she did the vault and was w- w- and and just went way off the end kind of thing. And thinking, you know what? That's just so interesting that she's practicing, going through the process even before the performance, mm-hmm. um, even as good as she is. Yeah. She's 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 just keeps right doing up it. To the moment. Yep. Mm-hmm. And and I do think that uh, although this isn't practice in the way that that we've really talked about in the context of the message, um I do think going to life group, being a part of worship, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in person in worship. Yeah. 
um, that's all a part of the fundamentals and just working through the things that you need to do to stay on track yeah. um, in, your, in your walk with Jesus. It's, ju- it's just so important to just the repetitions. Well, I, we've said before, you know, if you wait to get into a life group until you need a life group, it's too late. Yeah. You know, um, if uh, we had a, we had a guy in our life group who's um, whose house caught on fire recently, and um, if he had not been in a life group, he really wouldn't have had anybody to come alongside and help with the stuff that's happened after that. Right. But because he's been in a life group, when the need came, there were people to say, "Oh yeah, I'll come help. I'll, I'll do whatever yeah. I can." Um, yep. So that's so what important. They're for. Yep. 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 Practice, practice, practice. Right. Yeah. What else you got? Well, we have, uh, why did you call this the legalistic line? Uh, We kind of talked about that already. Yeah. Uh, I thought that that that's where I was going to go, but it really, um, in the context of, I I think as often as not, we justify our behavior. Um, We move the line to justify our behavior. Right. Okay. The whole idea of how important a spotter is in the balance beam. We just we talked, talked about, about that, that too. Yep. Good. Um, okay. Any examples of moving the line oh, that either we, justify behavior? Yeah. Um, uh, it's it's funny. There um, there were some things that didn't make in the message that I that I really thought, oh, that would be interesting to talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, let me just think what they were because I didn't. Did I write some down? Um, there's alcohol. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. On the legalistic so, end or baptism. Yeah, I grew up. I grew up. I this didn't make it in the message, but I talked about. I talked with somebody about it after the message. Mm-hmm. I grew up in a home where we didn't have alcohol. Actually, Same. there were there was because my grandfather was an alcoholic. I've I've said this before. There was a bottle. Um, in the cabinet above the refrigerator, but that refrigerator that no one could reach. And that was called Poppy's Medicine, um, because whenever he came <laughs> and he was around five kids, uh-huh. he needed medicine. Right. Um, uh, so, so I grew up in a world where I thought Christians, people who were committed to follow Jesus, they just didn't drink. Right. Um, and that was the line. That that's what I thought the line was biblically. That's and, same, that's how I grew up as well. And and then you read in First Timothy where Paul says to Timothy, hey, you need to take some wine because your stomach's messed up. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's like, oh, so it's not. Right. It's it's not sin to drink. And then um, in the requirement, again, in Timothy, when it talks about the requirements for uh, for an elder, um, church leader, and it says not given to much wine, Mm -hmm. it's like, wait a second. He could have said, uh, they should never yeah, drink at all, but um, but that's that's not where the the line was, and so oftentimes we we grow up hearing, uh, you know, I and again to have a to to have a line that you put like um, to try and protect people that's a good thing until that line becomes the the standard rather than what God has said. Mm-hmm. So like when when my kids were growing up. Um, I knew that they were going to disobey, so I drew a line that was that was way back because I wanted to deal with the disobedience without the consequences of severe stuff. I, I wanted them to be in a situation where they knew when we said, no, don't do that, that they would respond to that. I didn't want that to wait to happen until they were on the roof of the garage ready to fall off Mm -hmm. or ready to jump or whatever. And at that point for me to say, no, don't do that. And then say, watch me. Uh (laughs) I I wanted to establish that ahead of time. So the, uh, let's see, where, where was I on that? That the, um, it's, it's not a bad thing to draw a line for self-protection to just not make that the, the, um, the arbitrary kind of thing that, that yeah. gets you there. Alcohol was one. Um, another, another was um, w- sometimes we move the line. Um, let me think. I had another example that, that I wanted to go to um, that was, oh, 
it's it's it was this and and we can talk about it i can talk about it a little bit easier here than i could in the message much of christendom has said um all you have to do to respond to jesus is just really breathe a breath of faith in jesus and and where do you go for that you say oh the thief on the cross and when you read the account of what happened on the thief with the thief on the cross, what did Jesus say to him? He ultimately the, the the guy says to the other thief, you know, why are you why are you giving him um, crap? Because we deserve what we're getting. He's innocent. Right. And Jesus says to him, "Today you'll be with me in paradise." Jesus doesn't say to him, "You're going to be in heaven for eternity." He doesn't say to him, your sins are forgiven. What he says to him is, today you'll be with me in paradise. What's that mean? I don't know, because I don't, I don't have a good enough understanding of the difference between, in, in terms of even the biblical terms, of Gehenna and hell and paradise and heaven and how all that fits together. Someday, I think we will, when we're in eternity, we'll understand all that. But I think it's a dangerous thing to say, oh, yes, I understand this exactly, and therefore it, this means that, and that means that, and that means that. And, and so the thief on the cross, clearly Jesus was responding with, with a level of love and grace to him. But I think it's a stretch to say the thief on the cross, we know for sure is going to be in heaven for eternity. He may be, right? But uh, does that make any sense? It does. Is anybody I mean, getting really nervous <laughs> right now? <laughs> listen, yeah. listen to I've this. I've always thought of it the other way, like. But but see what I mean. Took him with him, you know. But yeah, that makes sense. What you're saying, I never thought of it that way. The, I I think that there are a lot of things, depending upon where you are doctrinally, on lots of stuff. There are things that we've just accepted. Well, it was like I talked about with communion. Um, yeah. I, you know, I grew up with this clear sense, oh, no, every Christian should be taking communion every right. Sunday to not do that sin. Like, I, I remember um, the, the first minister, the second minister that I served with that I, that I loved deeply, but, like, they lived about, I don't know, three-quarters of a mile from the church, kind of like my house mm -hmm. to the church, whatever. And I remember them talking about when there was a severe snowstorm in... Um, in, in D.C., that they walked from their house to the church so that they did, could take communion on Sunday morning. Is there anything wrong with that? Not at all. I, right. You know, the church, church was canceled or whatever. But there's not any sense that, um, that there is a law, you know, that, that God has mandated that we have to mm -hmm. have the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Right. Um, uh, it's a great thing. I, w I started to say in the message, I, w I wish we did. I, you know, I, I would like that. Um, we don't. And, that, and that's okay because mm -hmm. um, it's because that's not the, the line. Um, I, b baptism, um, it's, I think oftentimes there, depending upon where you are, we draw a line about baptism that can take us in any direction. So, so like, um, it's very easy to say, yes, yeah, Scripture says that, but that's not what that means. I was baptized, um, you know, I was baptized as a baby, mm -hmm. and, and so that, that's, that is what Scripture says. And, and like I would say, eh, that's, that makes me nervous because I don't think that that's what Scripture says. I, I think that there's a challenge for us to look at what Scripture says specifically, to look at the context, to have a good understanding of it, and and then to have some spotters around us to say, "Am I am I getting this right or not?" Right. Um, so th I think that there are a lot of things that we assume because of our Western culture too, mm -hmm. and the way that we've been taught, the influence of the Reformation or the influence of the Catholic Church or whatever it is that that. I think it it um, it challenges us to really go back to God's word and see what it says. I think I think for people who um, who grow up in the um, in the Catholic faith, um, 
and you talk about moving the line, mm -hmm. it's like for them, you, they would say, oh, no, the, the, to talk about moving the line from praying to Mary, that's like a big deal because that's right. like, oh, no, that's the right thing. And, and to be able to say, oh, no, when you read Scripture, and Scripture says there's one mediator between God and man, and, it, and it's Jesus, that's like a different line than they've ever yeah. grown up in the context of. And so it really is a challenge for us. I think the whole concept of the message is a challenge for us to keep going back to God's Word, keep studying, mm -hmm. keep learning, keep growing. Yeah, I agree. Do I have any, any uh, was there one more that I talked about that I wrote down? Nope. Okay. That was it. Uh, good. That's, that's all I got. I think that was great. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for hosting. Sure, anytime. <laughs> um, we'll see if they ask me back. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. A <laughs> uh, couple of things that probably we need to talk about just before we cut off. Mm -hmm. um, if anybody still wants to come to the Global Leadership Summit, it's going to be great. And it's Thursday and Friday. Still have a little bit of time. If you want to get in on that, let us know, and uh, we can help make that happen. Yep. And Sunday, uh, we've got lunch on the lawn going on. Yep. And so bring your lunch. Uh, we'll have grill fired up and ready to hot go. Hot dogs, chips. Hot, dog, ch hot dogs, pop, chips, and pop. And Kona ice. And Kona ice. So come uh, come bring just. Bring a lawn chair. Yeah, bring your lawn chairs. Come ready yep. to just kind of hang out and have some fun. Yep. Sounds good. Okay, now is the time where you get to wind it up and say, hey, thanks for watching. And we're out <laughs> thanks here. Thanks for watching, everybody. <laughs> Signing off. <laughs>